Hi everybody, it's time for my signature driving intro rant. Firstly, I want to say a huge thank you to everybody that subscribed and everybody that shared my videos on blogs and Facebook and everything like that. It's just crazy. Like, I can't believe how good the reception has been. Uh, it's really inspired me to keep doing more. Also, I've decided not to conform to what everybody else on YouTube seems to be doing, which is producing these short, you know, five to 12 minute long videos. Um, I would rather do one big video once a week and be able to cover something in depth because I mean the content of this channel is about things that are inherently technical and detailed. So I just don't think the five to 12 minute video format is going to work for me. So if you have the attention span of a turnip, then my channel is definitely not for you. Now, today what I have for you is a tutorial on how to make professional grade audio cables. Now, this is a pretty long video and I thought about splitting it up into a few different videos and I thought, well, actually it might be better to put my views up and things like that, but I don't really care about any of that. What I care about is helping to educate people. If you expect to be able to learn how to solder properly in less than 45 minutes, I'm sorry, but you are dreaming. I would sit down with my trainees that I have working for me and do an hour plus tutorial with them, showing them all the techniques and all the details and the little tips and tricks. I'm squeezing 20 years of experience into a 45 minute video. So I wanted to make this video as if you guys were sitting down doing one of my tutorials in the workshop. So I'm not cutting bits out, I'm not skipping over anything, I'm basically just doing the task at hand and talking about it and trying to explain it to the best of my ability. Once you learn how, you'll see actually how simple it is. It's not difficult at all. It's like anything, if you know how to do it, then it's easy. So sit down with me, grab a coffee, make a sandwich, watch, learn and listen. Be prepared to, you know, spend 45 minutes watching this. But at the end, you're going to know more than the basics. You're, you're going to actually know how to do this the proper way. So let's go back to the workshop and I'm going to take you through step by step. I'm just going to take you through the things that you need in order to do a decent job. So the first thing obviously that you need is some balanced audio cable, which means that it's shielded with two conductor wires on the inside. Now the quality of this can vary. Basically you get what you pay for. So get the best one you can afford. Then we have connectors. Now I've chosen the Neutrik NC3 series. You can see on the left is the female, on the right is the male. Anybody that's been in the industry for any time knows that Neutrik, you pretty much can't go wrong. Uh, it's made in Germany, designed in Germany, and you know, for cables that are gonna have a tough life, this is a great choice. Now here also I've just got some uh, jack cables from a local supplier just so that I can show you guys the process with jack connectors as well. Next thing is some heat shrink and you need to make sure that you have the correct diameter heat shrink for the cable that you're using. Now you can see there I've got uh, some clear heat shrink for some labels and some black heat shrink to help with the strain relief which we will go through later. And then next we have the tools. Um, having a decent Desk vise is very helpful, but not really necessary. Um, you can use something like one of these cable testers and just like plug your connectors into there to hold it steady. But really having some kind of vise is definitely the way forward. Probably the most important bit of kit for this job is a decent soldering iron. 
Now, this is a uh, Heiko 888D, and this is a great little cheap soldering iron. It's good quality, good heat capacitance, good tips. Now, also what's very important is the kind of tip that you use. Now, for making cables, you need good heat capacitance. And I'll explain to you what I mean by that uh, in the tutorial. But basically, a different tip to what you would use on doing circuit boards or something like that. We need something a little bit more heavy duty. Now, I like uh, this kind of tip that's like a got the diagonal cut off because it's got a nice big flat surface and uh, it holds the heat really well. It's great for tinning thick wires and uh, filling the buckets on the connectors. Now, another great thing to have is either a good multimeter with continuity or even better, a cable tester. Um, because, you know, obviously before you do the heat shrink up and close the connector, you want to make sure that your connections are good. Next, we have a labeling machine. Um, any labeling machine will do. If you don't have one, you can always use like some tape or a paint pen or something like that. But uh, yeah, I like to keep my cables labeled because it's often cables go for a walk and disappear. So it's always good to know which ones are yours. And then, uh, of course, we've got the heat gun which is the preferred way of doing up the heat shrink. I've seen people try and do it with soldering irons, lighters and all kinds of stuff. Don't recommend it. If you want a good clean job, get a heat gun. You don't have to get a Makita one. Even the, the cheap Junwa brands uh, will certainly do the job. So yeah, that's pretty much the lineup of what we need to do a proper job. So guys, I really can't stress enough how important prep is in making good cables. It's really the most important thing. So what I mean by prep is you treat it like a production line. So yeah, I gotta make 10 cables. I'm not gonna make one cable and then make another one and then make another one. What I'm gonna do is make them all simultaneously. And I do that by, you know, just basic manufacturing process, which is break it down into small steps. The first thing that we're gonna do is cut the cable lengths. So I want to make uh, a few seven meter cables, a few five meter cables, and a few four meter cables. So I'm just gonna go ahead and uh, cut them now. So now you can see that I have all the cables cut to length. I've just color coded them for my own convenience so that uh, I don't get them mixed up before they get labeled. One thing I forgot to mention in the tools is you need yourself a decent pair of cutters. These Nipex side cutters have got to be around seven years old and they're still sharp as the day that I got them. And they're also really cool because you, they have these little uh, stripping holes here which are really handy. But anyway, just make sure that you cut your cable with good cutters and not scissors or anything ridiculous like that. Okay, so the next thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna prep our connectors. First thing to do is get them all out of the plastic packet and break them down into parts. Okay guys, so this is what I mean when I say uh, prep the connectors. Now you might look at that and go, hey, Dude, like you've got a serious OCD problem, but no, there's actually a method to this madness. And I don't know how many of you who have made cables before have soldered on this beautiful connection, done the heat shrink up, and then realized that they left the back shell off the connector. By laying them out in order like this, first of all, I know that there was nothing missing out of the packets and that I have all the pieces because I counted them all and at a glance I can see that they're all there. Second of all, the parts are laid out in the order that I'm going to use them. First of all, I'm going to prepare the actual connector. Then the next thing I'm going to do is put on the back shell on the cable after I strip and tin the wires. So. Yes, it might look a little bit crazy, but it's for a reason. 
Okay guys, the next thing that I'm gonna do is cut the heat shrink for all the connectors. So I've actually got 13 cables that I'm gonna make. So what I want is 26 pieces of black heat shrink for the strain relief. Now that will go under the back shell of the connector and that's really going to increase the life expectancy of the cable. And then I want also these clear ones which will heat shrink over the top of the label that we make. Now if we just have a look at one of these connectors, what I want is for the heat shrink to be, you know, a good five, maybe more centimeters coming out the back of the shell. So I'm just gonna cut this first one where I had my finger. If you do like a dodgy cut on the end, when you shrink it up, it's gonna not look nice. So if you want a tidy job, cut with a sharp pair of scissors. Now I just need to replicate this uh, another uh, 25 times. Okay, so now you can see I have the connectors prepped and the heat shrink prepped. And one of the tricks to doing a tidy job is, you know, make sure that all your heat shrinks are cut to the same length. A millimeter or two is no issue, but you don't want one like a couple of centimeters longer than the other one, like it just looks dodgy. So yeah, just pay attention to those small details. It uh, doesn't take you any more time just to cut them, you know, precisely and actually care about the way the job looks at the end. The next thing that we need to do is prepare the actual connector with solder. So we need to fill the buckets in the connector with solder. Okay, so here I have a few connectors lined up in the vise. And a good little tip here is if uh, you just use a little bit of foam tape on the inside of the vise, you can just slide the connectors in and out without having to unwind it and wind it up again. So we're going to start with a hot soldering iron at uh, 300 degrees C. Now that's pretty hot, um, but the trick to doing these connectors is to work fast. And you need the heat uh, in order to transfer the heat into the little buckets. So we're also going to use just one millimeter, which again is kind of thick. You wouldn't use this on a PCB, but we actually want to get a fair bit of solder into those buckets. So the bigger the solder wire, the better. And of course, this is a uh, multi-core flux solder. Okay, so what we want to do is we want to just heat up the back side of the bucket and you can get a little bit of solder on the iron just so it makes more contact on the bucket and heats it up. And uh, ideally what we want to do is just push the solder into the bucket. Like this. And you can see that it's gone down in there and there's definitely enough solder in there to grab the cable when we put it in. So I'm going to go ahead and just finish these five. Now what we're looking for here is a nice shiny finish. We want to just melt that through, make sure that it drops in. We're not too concerned about it at the moment because we're going to tidy it all up when we put the cable in. Okay, so what we need to do to prepare the cable is we need to just snip around about 12 millimeters is ideal. For you Yankees, that's uh, about a half an inch. And just pull off and you can see there, I didn't cut any of the shielding off. If you cut a few strands off, it's not the end of the world, but it's better to keep as much as possible. And then uh, we want to go ahead and twist up
and you want to make sure the end is as neat as possible otherwise when you go to, to uh, solder to the connector it's going to give you troubles now for the process of tinning the idea is to heat up the wire with the iron and melt the solder onto the wire directly you're not trying to uh, melt the solder with the iron tip so if you just get a little bit of fresh solder it helps with the heat transference and you can see I'm heating the wire up and sometimes you just need to get it started and there it is now you can see that actually the flux and the solder has gone into the wire it's been absorbed because of the flux inside the solder so this is the ideal way to tin and now next we want to just cut off the cotton core and then just grabbing those wires tightly between your uh, thumb and forefinger it's hard to do with a camera in front of me I want to just grab off about three millimeters is perfect and then we give those a twist and again tin don't want too much solder on there just the wires soaked up with solder and then this is pretty much uh, perfect for an XLR with an unbalanced cable it's really important that you adopt the practice of shorting the cold wire the white one in this case to the ground wire um, and you just strip it down more than you normally would and twist it together the reason that you do this is because if you have a, a mixer with an XLR input the way that it detects that the circuit is unbalanced or that the input signal is unbalanced is uh, by detecting a cold short to ground so if the mixer detects that there's a cold short to ground then it knows it's an unbalanced signal um, and will make the necessary adjustments if you just hook up the ground and plus the signal will not be correct if it's expecting a differential pair and it doesn't get it then the gain stage circuitry will not work properly so anyway moral of the story if you're making an unbalanced connection with a cable that has two conductors just by habit short the cold to ground and you can save yourself some head scratching later in the future okay guys so now we have everything prepped we've got our cables with the ends prepped we've got our connectors with the buckets tint we have our heat shrink ready to go the last thing we need to do to prep is put the back shell on the connector and the heat shrink on the cable and then we're good to make the connection and really if you've done all these steps so far right then it's going to be a good cable like we've done the hard work already so it's pretty much impossible to screw it up if you've got all this part right so now we're at the last stage of prep and uh, that is basically getting everything ready to solder so I'm gonna pick uh, an end first we'll start with the female end because they're here and you want to put the back shell on first just push it through and then we want to put our heat shrink on which can be tricky <laughs> and now that connector is ready to solder now the reason why I pick one side and don't uh, do the male and female ends now is because I've had before where the shell fell off and then I solder it up and then I look down on the floor and hey there's the shell so better to just concentrate on one side first and get it done so I'm gonna go and prep all of these now so now I have all the cables with the back shell on and the heat shrink on 
I have all my cables stripped and tinned. I have all my connectors lined up with their buckets filled with solder. And now the actual soldering connection part is kind of the easiest part. Now, one thing I like to do is, even though I've been doing this for 20 years, and uh, you know, I should know what I'm doing, is I will always look on the connector. Now, the reason why I check is because some brands have the buckets flipped around the other way. So you can get confused, you think, oh yeah, yeah, pin one should always be on the left. But uh, it depends which way you, you do it and which sex it is. So better to just double check for your own peace of mind before you start. And here I can see that indeed, pin one is on the left. And uh, with uh, a balanced audio connection, pin one is going to be my ground. So what I want to do is uh, I don't want to actually connect the ground first because because there's so much tinning on the ground wire, if I connect the ground first, the it becomes hard to move. So what I actually want to do is connect my hot wire to pin two first. So I'm just going to heat up this bucket. I'll, I'll do this one first so you can see maybe better. I'm just going to heat up this bucket until I see the solder melt and I can see it now. And then I'm going to drop this in, count to one and let go. Then um, I already, I've positioned it so that already the cold wire is in place. So now again, I need to just heat this bucket, wait for the solder to melt and it's already sucked it in. And I can see there that that is a good joint because the solder's flowed over, the tinning in the wire has become molten and it's sort of coagulated in with the solder that was in the bucket. So this is a good connection. Now for the last one, I'm going to repeat the process. And there we go. Now I can just see everything go molten. Let go. And then again, great reason why I put this uh, tape inside, because I can just pull this one out and get it out of the way. I will do a pull test. Always do a physical stress test, just to make sure that your connections are physically good. And uh, on to the next one. And you can see that once your prep is done, this is a fast process. Now all the little things that I said in the beginning of the tutorial, you know, you want three millimeters tinned here. You don't want big amounts of unprotected wire sticking out because if it twists, then you get a short. You just want the perfect amount to sit in the bucket. So what, that took maybe 20 seconds. Do the pull test. And the idea of how to do this quickly is to just get into a routine, you know, and I, even though I've done this so many times before, I still say in my head, okay, pin one. So you can, you can really see the prep, prep is everything. I, I'm churning out cables now at what would seem to be an astonishing rate, but it's just because I've done the right prep. Now you may remember earlier in the video I was saying how it's important to have a tip with good capacitance and the reason for this is that the pins in these connectors act like a, a heat sink and suck the heat away from the tip. So if you have a poor soldering iron um, you're going to have trouble getting all that solder down all the way in the bucket molten which is really important for making a good joint. Um, if you only sort of do half of it, it sort of, it cracks because there's different temperatures adjacent to each other. So you really need the right tools to do this, not one of these little soldering sticks. Um, and I highly recommend, uh, the Heiko triple eight. I used to be a big fan of Weller, but, uh, recently they seem to fail a lot to be honest, and they're, they're pretty expensive tools, and when they work, they're great, but I've had a lot of problems with them, and probably in the last, I don't know, maybe five years, 
I've gone through a lot of Weller products um, before I expected them to be at end of life. Yeah, basically I've had those pyro pens. They're amazing when they work, the, the gas powered pens, but the reliability on them is rubbish. I've gone to a few different jobs like with my pyro pen needing it to work and then the thing just doesn't light. And uh, I actually had one melt itself, which was pretty dangerous. Um, so yeah, I've gone off Weller a bit. And Heiko just makes good stuff. We've got a good range of stuff, the high-end ones, the cheaper ones like the AAA. Yeah, highly recommend it. Check it out, Heiko. And there we go, I've just basically soldered um, 27 solder connections in well under 10 minutes. Okay, so now I need to prep the other end. Uh, so we're gonna do the male end. And uh, this is the end that's going to have the heat shrink for the label. Now the reason why I will only put a label on the male end is because the male end is normally out of the way. It's, a, it's plugged into a multi-core or into the back of a mixer and it's handy to be able to see the labels uh, in those locations. But like there's nothing uglier than having your lead vocalist with a mic lead coming out of their SM58 and uh, it's got a cable label like just below it. So yeah, I just put um, labels on the male ends in general. So for this one, we want to put the cable label heat shrink on first and then the back shell and then the strain relief black heat shrink. And now this one's ready to go. So I'm gonna go ahead and prep all the connectors like this. Now I have all the connectors prepped with the clear heat shrink, the back shell, and then the strain relief heat shrink. I have all the male XLR connectors sitting there ready to go. Now again, I'm gonna do it, follow my own advice. I'm gonna check out the pinout, um, which we have uh, pin one on the right, which, you know, makes sense. So we're going to start with pin two, like we did before the hot wire. And we're going to go just same as before, heat up, drop it in there. I'm just, you need to like bend the wire. So it wants to go in place. This is actually a good little trick. Uh, that I don't even think that I'm doing it, but that's just habit. Yeah, if you get get it to automatically uh, sit where it should go, then you don't have to fiddle around with it. So yeah, just like bend the wire, get it in place there. Um, make sure you don't burn your fingers. And just get that to heat up. There it goes. And there we go. Oh. Ah, that one just failed the pull test. That is why we do the pull test. Now guys, if, if you learn anything at all from this tutorial, though there's, there's two things that I would want you to learn from this tutorial. One is have the right tools. <laughs> because if you try and do this kind of work with crappy tools, you are going to get a crappy result. I guarantee this. And the second thing is that, you know, good soldering is not difficult. It's, um, it's all in the prep. If you do your preparation right, if you strip the wires to the correct lengths, if you tin them nicely, if you, you know, pay attention and, and, and use the correct methods, then soldering is easy. You know, making these kind of cables is easy. And uh, don't let the audio fools tell you any differently, but the, this is exactly, exactly the kind of uh, cable that, you know, I would, would and have built for cinemas, TV studios, recording studios, live concerts, nightclub installations, you name it. If you go into those racks and you have a look, you will see cables that were made with 
exactly this method. So I'm telling you, if, if you make these cables for your studio or for your DJ setup, they're going to be great. They're going to work really good. And they will probably last you, you know, a lifetime if they're not being punished and a long time if they are being punished. I'll just take you guys quickly through the process of the quarter inch jack. I've already done the prep. I've got the back shell on. I've got the heat shrink ready to go. Just one quick note. Often these connectors come with this little plastic sleeve here. Uh, what you should do with that is it's rubbish. Don't use it. Use heat shrink instead. If you have no heat shrink, then use it. But really, you shouldn't be making cables without heat shrink. Now, it, yeah, it's a slightly different uh, method here. What we need to do, you'll see that I've, uh, the way that I've stripped and tinned it, there's just one more stage that I need to do. And that is, I want to put the cable where this pinching strain relief is going to grab onto the rubber. So measuring that, then I need to cut off the ground wire so that it's the correct length. And then we just connect the hot. And then we just push it down. See how the hot wire now has uh, no tension on it? This is a good thing. This is gonna make the cable last a lot longer. And now I just want to connect this earth wire ground wire there we go and then we want to do the pull test on this one as well and you can see there that there is no strain being put on that uh, signal wire at all so here is uh, the last step and it really honestly every step is as important as the next and this step is just the visual inspection. So we want to make sure that I haven't made any compounding mistakes and what that means is that like after I did the fifth one, I started doing the pin out backwards or something like that, which is totally possible, especially when you're talking, making a video and stuff like that. So I want to look with this way, silver left, white middle, red right, on the male end. And there's a mistake. And this is why the visual inspection, if you want to have the statistics of, you know, 100% working cable ratio, which, you know, it's something I strive for. I can tell you an interesting story just while I'm fixing this actually, is uh, myself and one of my buddies, Pete Goodhart, uh, we built a venue together called Blue Marlin and Pete did all the rack wiring and I did all the other terminations. So for the speakers, the DJ booth, all that kind of stuff. And, uh, even though two different guys did either end of the cable and uh, I'm not sure how many connections there would have been in that venue. I would say thousands, Def yeah, definitely thousands uh, if you're counting every pin. We screwed up one cable which over a six week install we made a mistake on one cable and Pete's gonna tell you that it was my fault, but I, I'm still, the jury's out. But anyway, it was, uh, it was a network cable that didn't work. Every single audio cable, every single speaker cable, all worked. See, built-in error correction, no problem. Okay, so that's the, that's the mail end checked. Now I'm gonna go ahead and check all the female ends. I like checking out females. So long story short here guys, um, I was actually gonna edit this out, but I won't because 
You know, I want to drive home the point of how important the visual inspection is. Uh, I just checked and almost every single female connector I did backwards. And that's because I'm too busy yapping on to you guys and all that kind of stuff. But, um, you know, I don't count it as a fail because I didn't heat shrink it. I caught it on the visual inspect, which is the reason why there is a visual inspect. So, um, yeah, I, I, I don't count that as a fail. I actually count that as a win for sticking to methods. Basically, I just wanted to tell you guys that I had to redo half of the female connectors. And probably you guys were like yelling at me when I was, <laughs> when you were watching me do it. But um, anywho, it's all good now. On to the last step. Okay guys, so the next um, and last step before we do the heat shrink is to just um, plug them in and give them a test. So uh, all I'm testing is for pins one, two and three, which it tells us is all good. It's giving me a false reading to ground, but uh, yeah, I can ignore that. You can see here, one, two, three. All good. So I'm just gonna go and test them all. Okay, so we've got them. They've all passed the test. It's amazing. Now, all we need to do is uh, apply the heat shrink and put the shells on. So this is the fun bit. I don't know why, but I love doing heat shrink. Never get bored of it. So I'm gonna go and shrink them all up. Okay, so we've got our shrunk up connectors with our back shells on. Now the last thing to do is to uh, put the back shells on, which is, you know, also kind of satisfying. It's like, wow, all that work. It's done. And it looks like uh, something professional. Nice and tight. And not only does it look professional, but uh, I have faith that this cable is going to do its job exceedingly well. I mean, I could have easily uh, put higher spec cable, you know, more expensive cable, better shielding, that kind of stuff. But, you know, e everything uh, needs to be fit for purpose. And the purpose of this is I'm actually supplying these so that a venue can do a live band and this venue never does live bands. And basically I wanted to give them something good quality, reliable, but it doesn't need to be tour grade, you know. I'm not using Canair cable or anything like that. That's about the only way I could have made this better. And there's one other way I could have made this better. I could have, um, I could have put some glue inside the heat shrink of the connector, which maybe I'm going to show you on the jack cable because they always get punished with guitars and things. So yeah, I might show you how to do that. But yeah, there is an almost finished cable. No label yet. Yeah, what the hell. Let's put the label on. Type in uh, the venue name. And this one is a four meter. Print that little sucker. By the way, that's annoying, huh? Look, every single time I print, I waste that much tape. Why do they do, well, I know why they do that. Because the tape's expensive. That's why they do that. Okay, so now I have my little uh, label. And I want to just put it, you know, 30 centi away from the plug. The reason why I want to put it that far away is because here is where it always bends and flexes. So might as well give the label a fighting chance of, of lasting. So there we go, we've got our label on, stuck on, 
and then we're gonna quickly do our clear heat shrink over the top oh yeah heat shrink love heat shrink And that, guys, is a finished cable. Woohoo! Now, as promised, I'm going to show you the glue method for just making the cables a little bit extra heavy duty. Now, you can see I've got this unbalanced jack connector, which is likely going to be used by musicians and guitarists and things like that and it's probably not going to get treated very well so i want to make it as strong as possible so first of all we crimp up the metal strain relief that's built into the connector making sure that it's grabbing the rubber and not the wire we have the heat shrink here ready to go but before we put the heat shrink on i actually want to fill this part of the connector with non-conductive silicon. I can recommend uh, this brand because on the back it specifically says that it's non-conductive. On the top there it says protects and repairs electrical wiring. So I know that this is not going to bother the connection inside. So what we need to do is just fill this gap inside I don't really mind if we put a little bit too much and you'll see why in a minute. And then I want to make sure that the top of the connector there is covered. Hopefully you can see there. Now what we want to do is slide the heat shrink over the top of the glue and then we need to shrink up the, the heat shrink. And the last step is to just slide that back shell over and you can see when I do it up the silicon just gets sucked into the thread and that's an added bonus because that is going to stop the connector coming undone. Now, this is a, a non-repairable connection. If this one breaks, you just chop the end off and be done with it. There's no way that you can get that open, get all the glue out, get the heat shrink off and repair it. So yeah, that's the way to make bulletproof cables. You can also apply that technique to RCA cables. You can apply it to XLR cables. Pretty much any cable that you're putting heat shrink over, you can do it because the heat shrink helps contain the glue. Uh, without the heat shrink, it can get very messy. Hi guys, to all of you who are stuck through to the end of the video, uh, well done, that's uh, pretty impressive. Thanks for watching. I hope you learned something. Um, yeah, I mean, you just have to practice everything that I showed you in that video. You definitely get faster with practice and you get more accuracy with practice. So it's like anything, the more times you repeat it, the better you're gonna get at it. So I hope you guys get to make a few cables for your home studios or your instruments or something like that. I hope some good comes of this video. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget, give me a thumbs up and hit the subscribe button. I've got some really cool videos coming up, which I'm excited for you all to see. I'm also in the works of developing a new forum, The Bright Pixel, uh, for people like us to just sort of get together online and discuss things you know, electronics, entertainment, audiovisual, that kind of stuff. If you want to keep updated on what videos I'm doing next and my general day-to-day -day goings on, you can follow me on Twitter with the handle at James Fields. Links down below. I'll see you next week. Thanks for watching.